Crossing Church, how are you doing? Hey, okay, there you are. I want to welcome everyone that's joining from all of our locations. Wow, I'm way up here. This is a weird feeling. And, uh, I, I, and either I'm heavy or the uh, plywood is light because I'm feeling spongy. So if you see me disappear, hopefully it wasn't a spiritual thing. It was just, uh, it was just a malfunction of the state. No, I, I am, uh, I'm just, it's just thrilling to be able to be a servant of the Lord, and that's what you are. Uh, so many of you have made a personal decision for Christ, and that personal decision has reflected in, uh, in the way that you've chosen to live your life out in the world, and you're living your life out loud. So it's not a secret life, it's not a, a, a you know, undercover life. You are who you are. This is, this is who you are. And uh, you know, what I've seen from that in, and what really the rest of the country has seen from that is what God does through that. Uh, and that is that so many people at all of our locations have brought so many other people uh, to, to uh, our locations that we've had to continue to add services. And uh, there's a magazine. It's called Outreach Magazine. It, uh, it's put out by Lifeway. And uh, they keep a list of churches that are the fastest growing churches in the nation and the largest churches in the nation. And we have been on that top 100 list of the fastest growing churches in the nation three out of the last four years. And you know, and let me tell you, that isn't, that isn't what's going on up here. It's what's going on out there. Uh, I already invited everybody I know. You know, but uh, it, it has to do with all the people that you know. And it is such uh, an awesome thing to see so many lives changed and, and opened up and yielded to uh, the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit and what He can do when we give our lives to Christ and let Him have His, his way and His rightful place and how He makes things right, how He put th puts things right. Even though it might not be the easiest life, to live. It is the richest life to live. And I'm just so thankful for that. And you know, we're in a series and the reason that we're, it looks the way it looks up here is of course, we're getting ready for uh, Crossing Live, our vacation Bible school. And of course, it gets exciting around here when there's a thousand kids in this room and thousands of kids in all of our other locations. And we're able to just instill that relationship and that love of Christ with all uh, of those young people. That's exciting. It's an exciting time, a time I know that God really shows up. And uh, we're in a series that's connected to that called The Locker Room. And uh, specifically what we're looking at is the kinds of things that, that we say when we're wanting to encourage uh, people as they go out, like athletes as they go out uh, before the game or at halftime or even at the end of the game. Those talks that happen in the locker room. And if there is one scripture in the Bible that gets used more than any other scripture when it comes to encouragement, personal encouragement or encouragement from one person to another, it's probably Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. How many of you have heard that verse before? Yeah, we hear that verse over and over again, and we hear it in a lot of different contexts. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I think it's one of the most encouraging and amazing statements of the Bible, and I also think it's one of the most misunderstood statements of the Bible. Because what we end up doing, without meaning to, is that we make that verse into a cliche. We make it into some spiritual cliche, one size fits all scripture, without really understanding what Paul was trying to say, why he was saying that, what caused his mind to come up with that sentence under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And what I want us to do today is I want us to understand that scripture. I want us uh, to learn what it seeks to teach us and what Paul seeks to teach us through it. And then I want to, uh, want to apply it to our lives because we really need it. We all really need it. Some of you are here, and you look great, by the way. And I'm sure at all the locations, you all look great. But maybe that's just on the outside. You know what I'm saying? You look good if other people look at you. You put on a good front. But 
uh, if people can see on the inside, there's a lot more going on in there that really needs to have the healing power of this verse of Scripture. And I just want that to be what happens when we spend our time uh, together today. You know, the, the, uh, there are a lot of false applications of this, and you know, you probably will see it in, uh, in like, you know, the Olympics are going on, and you might see it, you know, I can do all things, you know, I, can, I can win this race, I, I can be victorious, I can finish that marathon, I can do all of this through Christ who, get, who strengthens me, but it's really outside of the context. And in order to understand it, i got to take you back, and we're going to have to do a little history lesson together, and I think you'll all manage that really well, but it'll help you to understand this verse. You see, about 12 years before the Apostle Paul put pen to paper and wrote that statement down to the Philippians, about 12 years before that, he was about my age, 50 to 52, and he was on his second missionary journey. What Paul did was he made it his mission to spread the gospel to the known world. And uh, he took a, an initial journey uh, in his known world. Uh, it was the first missionary journey. And he established churches. He came back uh, to Antioch. And that was kind of his home base. And then he, established, then he started a second journey with a guy named Silas. Paul and Silas went on this journey, and as they went, they encouraged the churches that they had been to before, and then they also established churches and established new believers in these new communities. Well, this second missionary journey was especially interesting because it was the first time the gospel, the message of Jesus, went to Europe. It never had been to Europe before, and Paul actually made it to a place called Philippi, which is technically in Europe, it's not in Asia anymore. You know how it started in Asia and in the Middle East and it moved over to the West all the way to Europe to this place called Philippi. Well, Philippi was a, a city that was full of Roman citizens. Now, we might not be able to correctly appreciate what it meant to be a Roman citizen, but there were a lot of people that lived in that ancient world that weren't Roman citizens. And if you were a Roman citizen, you had a lot of rights. And if you weren't, you didn't. People could actually buy citizenship uh, or born and be born into citizenship. But it was a city of Roman citizens, had very few Jews in it. Now, Paul was a Jew. And so when he would go to one city after another, he would start his ministry in a synagogue or around a, a group of, of, of Jews, his own people. And then it might spread out from there. But when he went to Philippi, there really weren't very many Jews. Very few, as a matter of fact. So few that there was no synagogue. So he found where they would congregate. It was by a stream. It was to the west of the city. Uh, a lot of women would be there washing clothes. And he started to proclaim the gospel by this stream. And there was a, a, a woman there that he met. Her name was Lydia. And uh, she was actually a, a professional uh, lady, a, a small business owner. And uh, she accepted Christ and took Paul and Silas in, and it kind of established a little bit of a beachhead for them to uh, share the gospel in Philippi. So as he was sharing while he was there, there was this girl, this little girl, that would follow them around while they were, while they were teaching. And she would constantly interrupt Paul. Constantly interrupt because... The Bible says that she had this demonic presence in her. And she could tell people's futures with it. And she, had, she was a slave girl. She had owners. And the owners were making money off of her ability to tell uh, people's future, to divine their future. And she would walk around uh, Paul and Silas and interrupt them. And finally, Paul had enough of it. And he turns around and he looks at the little girl and he says, You come out of her. And he exercised that demon right there. And she, she was freed of it. But being freed of it meant that she couldn't tell people's fortunes anymore. And the guys that owned her as a slave got really angry because they lost their way to make money. And they grabbed Paul and Silas and arrested them and hauled them before the, the local rulers, the magistrates, okay? And uh, the, the local magistrates really didn't even question them very much or anything, just beat them within an inch of their lives and took them to the prison and put them down into the lowest part of the prison, prison 
fastened their feet in stocks and their, uh, and their arms in chains and left them there overnight till the next day. Here's what they didn't know. Paul was a Roman citizen. And as a Roman citizen, you could not beat him. You couldn't imprison him without due process of law. So, you know, I kind of scratch my head and I go, why didn't Paul say, hey, before you pick up that whip, boy, and do what your master tells you, you need to understand that I'm a Roman citizen. And he could have. And they would have stopped everything. Why would Paul allow that to happen to him? Hmm. I've tried to answer that. You know, the Bible doesn't explain it. I wonder sometimes if it was because of Silas, because Silas was with him and wasn't a Roman citizen. And he probably didn't want to leave Silas by himself to take a beating by himself. And since he was mentoring and discipling him, he was going to stay right next to him. He wasn't going to let him have to deal with any of that punishment or that difficulty alone. Sometimes I wonder if Paul was just crazy enough to see an opportunity in a beating. Because he was some kind of guy, some kind of hero, this guy. Well, this had happened 12 years before he wrote this, all right? So he's down there in the prison cell in the middle of the night with Silas. And some of you know this story. Around midnight, he goes, hey, Silas, do you know any good songs? And they're bleeding and they're hurting and they're cramping and it's nasty and there's rats and it stinks. Do you know any good songs? And I can just imagine Silas going, what? My back is bleeding, it's hurting, it's stinging, there's something nibbling on my toes, I'm cramping. So are mine, Silas. Do you know any good songs? They started to sing hymns around midnight in the absolute darkness of this dungeon. And there was an earthquake. It opened up all the cell doors. And the jailer who was, who was assigned to guard them thought all the people had, all of the prisoners had run away. And so he pulls his sword to kill himself, to fall on it, because they're going to kill his whole family for losing his, uh, his charge, you know. And, uh, and Paul says, don't hurt yourself. We're all still here, which is powerful. That means, you know what that means? Not only did he and Silas stay, but the, they must have been great singers. Because <laughs> they all stayed. They all stayed. And, 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 you know, the Philippian jailer goes, what do I have to do to be saved? And he wasn't talking about from hell. He goes, how do I get out of having to kill myself? That was his moment. He didn't understand about being saved. But then Paul used that opportunity to tell them about Jesus. And they took him out of the prison and they washed their wounds and cleaned them up. And you know, the Apostle Paul was holding all the cards. He was the Roman citizen. It wasn't the jailer that was going to get in trouble. It was the ones who put him in there that were going to get in trouble. You know why I love that story? Because that's where the Philippian church actually began. It began in a jail cell, in a dungeon. And the way I like to say it is it, it was born out of suffering. You know, Paul left that city, and he left it with a nucleus of believers, and that church grew, and it flourished, but they never forgot how they were born. They never forgot that they were born out of suffering. And 12 years later, they hear that the Apostle Paul is in prison in Rome. And he's suffering. And they take an offering. It's a poor church. But they take an offering and they send it with a guy named Epaphroditus. And they said, Epaphroditus, we want you to take this with you. We want you to encourage the Apostle Paul. And so he goes all the way from Philippi to Rome with this money. Because if you're in a prison in Rome, they don't give you three hots and a cot. That you don't get cable. If you're in a prison in Rome, if you don't have family that takes care of you, you starve. And so he really needed people to, to, to remember him and to help take care of him. And here Epaphroditus comes, and he comes with this that'll pay for uh, what his needs are when he's there. And actually, Epaphroditus almost dies and uh, uh, comes back from actually the point of death. And uh, Paul is so thankful for what the Philippians did that he sits down. See, I had to bring you here. 
he sits down with a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen, and he begins to write the book of Philippians, which is a thank you for what they did and how they remembered him. Now, take that and lay it over Philippians chapter 4, 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What is he talking about? What are all things? What are all things? You see, what we want to do is make that so generic, like it's anything, like the Apostle Paul's talking about just anything, but he's not. He's not talking about just anything. He's talking about the kind of suffering that he has endured for the sake of Jesus Christ and the gospel. I can endure this. I can manage this. I can come out victorious on the other side, even though I'm in a jail cell because Christ is giving me the strength I need to carry on. That's what he's saying. I think that so many times when we read this, we're just talking about being winners and success and stuff like that, but it's really about endurance, and it's about endurance through suffering. It's a statement that is made through tears and grief and loneliness and poverty. And some of you right now, if we could see beyond the facade that you have so well made so that everybody else thinks that everything's fine, if we could look on the other side of that, we would see those things. We would see the tears and the grief and the loneliness and the poverty. We would see the hurt and the pain inside there, right? This is why you so desperately need this verse. When you feel like you're just going to collapse, when you feel like you just can't take it anymore, like the water is over your nose. Like you're on, at the end of your rope, but nobody tied a knot. You know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And these are not things that we bring upon ourselves. I want you to know that when, when he's talking about this, he's talking about suffering for Christ. He's not talking about suffering because you just made a lot of bad moves made a lot of poor decisions. He's talking about suffering for Christ. And it was that kind of a fellowship that bound the church, the Philippian church, to Paul. So what I want to do right now is I just want to take some time and talk about suffering because I think suffering is something that really trips us up, especially when we put God in the equation. I mean, how many of you have said something like, why are you letting this happen to me, God? Have Real, have, okay, I won't say if you said it. Have you heard it? Four people. <laughs> Don't want to own it, but it's true. Why do we have to suffer? Why, why, in, why in the world does this even exist? Why do we have to do this? Why would God allow such a thing on earth? You know, a lot of people go, I don't want to believe in God because I don't know how I can believe in a God that allows all this suffering in the world, right? Have you heard that? Have you said that? You're not going to like what I'm going to say next. God hates to see us suffering, but suffering is ultimately our fault. Oh, man. Olympics were on. I could have stayed home. Do you know when suffering is first mentioned in the Bible? Suffering is first mentioned in the Bible as it pertains to childbirth. When God created the world, there wasn't any suffering. When God created the world, there wasn't any hurt, pain, loss, any of that stuff. It was not there. It wasn't the way that God created. But when man sinned, the ultimate result of that sin was suffering. And it's interesting, isn't it, that God chose childbirth to be one of those places where suffering would begin in this world. So what I can say from that is that every one of you, every one of you, every location, every one of you was born through suffering. Some of you got, I had a C-section, sorry I was out. <laughs> Cheater. But anyway, we were, really, think about it. We were born through suffering. You know, it makes you wonder sometimes, how many of you have children and that's caused suffering? Yeah, it doesn't just happen when they're born, right? 
It doesn't just happen when they're born. You can go through so much in life. You can handle so much in life. But when your kids do stuff, they take your legs out, don't they? And if you want to know what suffering is, be a parent. Just be a parent. So, you know, it makes you wonder, like, why would I even do that? Why would I even want to be a parent? So why are you? Some of you say, why does God allow suffering, right? You might as well ask him this. Why did you want to be a parent, God? Why did you want to have children? Why did you have us? So God could ask you the same question. Well, why did you have children? Maybe you can answer it that way. Kind of hard to answer that question, isn't it? Well, I, I just wanted to. I just, I just, I don't, it just, it was just, it's part of my nature, that's right. It was part of God's nature to have children. And children have caused him a great deal of suffering. And he sees us suffer. And it wasn't God's idea. Suffering is ultimately our fault. But here's the second thing. Even though suffering comes from sin, and that's the point I'm making, suffering comes from sin, God is not, allow, does not, is not content to allow us to continue to suffer. So he sent Jesus to suffer in our place. In Isaiah 53, in the Old Testament, it was written over 700 years before Jesus was born. It says, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with suffering. Listen to me. You were born through suffering. And those of you that are believers in Christ, you were born again through suffering. Somebody had to suffer. The reason we have Mother's Day is because somebody had to suffer for you to come into this world. And the reason we have the Lord's Day is because somebody had to suffer for you to have a heavenly home. Mm. Suffering is something that is no respecter of persons, right? Right? And you see that happen. There's a lot of people that are, that are, you're going, you're not living for God at all. And it seems like they're getting by easy and I'm dying here. How come that? That's not fair. Well, the, the bottom line is suffering happens to everybody. doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. You, you, don't get a, you don't get out a suffering pass card by God when you become a Christian. A lot of times when you become a Christian, you suffer more. There's no guarantees about that. But listen, when you're a Christian, God gives purpose to your suffering. You don't suffer for nothing. God, and this is where I really want to drill down on Philippians 4.13. 4, it says, I can do all things, and all things means the things that I endure through suffering. That's what Paul's referring to. It says, I can do all th things through him who strengthens me. So the first thing that we need to understand that gives purpose to suffering is it draws us to Jesus Christ. And we get to meet Jesus Christ. In the midst of suffering, when we are our weakest, that's when he becomes in the most focus. That's when we see him the best. And we relate to him the most, right? That's why the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians says, he says, you know, he prays to God to take away a thorn in the flesh. And God says, no, my grace is sufficient for you. He prayed three times and God said, nope, nope, and nope. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. And then Paul says, then I will glory in my sufferings. I will glory in my persecution. Why? Because when I am weak, then I am strong. Because that is when I sense Christ in me. It's not me, it's him. So he gives purpose to suffering. When we go through suffering, and I know this is true because I've experienced this kind of grief before. And I know that this is true, that we are drawn closer to God through that suffering. And I wish it wasn't that way, it just is. Because that we have that, such that rebellious heart, that independent automaton kind of heart, we find Christ, His glory, and it's through Christ. So through Christ, it says, who strengthens me. The second part is that God allows suffering to make us more like Christ. We get strong like Him through that suffering. 
That's why in the book of James it says, you know, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Endurance or perseverance. It makes you stronger. It's not something you really want to go through, but it makes you stronger. I've actually heard people say that when you lift weights, the way you build muscle is by tearing muscle. It's by tearing and healing. Burning and tearing that muscle actually makes it grow back and heal stronger. And that's exactly what happens when our faith, with our faith in Christ, that God gives purpose to our suffering. I just, you know, if I'm going to suffer, and everybody in this world, because of the sin that, the, that, that we brought into this world, is causing suffering, at least give me some purpose in it. At least make it make some sense. Third thing, God provides for us even in the midst of it. Because even though we go through suffering, God's giving us purpose and he provides for us. Here's something I love about God that he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful and will not suffer you to be tempted, suffer you to be tempted above what you're able. But with that temptation will provide a way of escape that you may endure it. You know what that means is that God's He's watching you and he's going, and, and, and when something's coming along that's over the line, it doesn't come along. Now, some of you are going to say, well, God missed it on this one because it took me over the line. And you might think you're smarter than God. A lot of times we do that, don't we? We, we want to we do the umpiring from the cheap seats. But the fact is, he tells us that, and I trust God for that, that God's not going to give me more than I can bear, and I get peace from that. Secondly, and would you please hear me, hear me on this one, for Christians, and some of you here today, or one of our locations today, many of you are Christians, and some of you aren't. I want you to hear this. For Christians, suffering is temporary. And that's a promise. Take that to the bank. For Christians, suffering is temporary. But for non-Christians, it's permanent. I don't want that. No. If I'm going to have to go through suffering, give me some purpose and make it temporary. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, listen to what Paul says. Same guy, same writer. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For, moment, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, the temporary, but at the things which are not seen. That's those are eternal things, right? For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The things of this world and the rules that go along with this world are temporary rules for Christians. They are permanent rules for non-Christians. So, God won't take you beyond your breaking point. And suffering is only temporary for the children of God. And here's the one I really want you to hear. We never look more like Jesus than when we suffer for Him. Let that sink in. You know, turkey's always better when it's basted. You need to be basted in this one. And I'm not calling you a turkey, all right? But we never look more like Jesus than when we suffer for him. You know, the Apostle Paul, later on in, in Philippians, says that he wanted to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. He actually wanted to know him that way. In verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 4, where we were just a little while ago, it says this, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body of the dying Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. 
For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. When we suffer for Jesus, we look like Him. We all suffer. We're all going to suffer. Like my friend Ray says, everybody gets a turn. It's just part of this life. But the question that I'm going to ask you today is this. Does your suffering have purpose? And do you have any control over it? See, this is one thing that's cool about Paul and this story of Paul. He had complete control over this, right? I mean, he could have stopped it. And he chose not to. Because he saw opportunities to reach people for Christ that, were more, that was more valuable to him even than his own suffering. Wow. <laughs> so Paul made his suffering have purpose. And he knew it was only going to be temporary. You know, I think the locker room is an appropriate title for this sermon, but not because of the theme of Vacation Bible School but because actually Paul was in the locker room and it wasn't a place where you shower and change. It was a place where he lived, a place behind bars, a place with guards that he couldn't leave. When he wrote Philippians, he was in prison. He was locked in a room. But he didn't look at it like being locked in a room. He looked at it like all those guards couldn't get away from him because he had a different attitude about his suffering. A few years ago, there was an Academy Award winning movie that came out. I think it was by James Cameron, same guy that did Avatar and, and all that. And it was called The Locker Room. Uh, not The Locker Room. It was called The Hurt Locker. I don't know how many of you remember the movie, saw the movie. But uh, what the movie was about was about a guy who did a, a bomb disposal unit and a guy who uh, disarmed bombs in the Middle East, like IEDs that were like buried in the road, and he would have to uh, go in and put all this stuff on, all this protective gear, and he had his little, you know, uh, uh, microphone that he could talk to the guys who would stay back because there was this huge blast perimeter, and nobody else could go in the blast perimeter but this guy, and he would go in there, and he would work on disarming this IED, and, and that blast perimeter was called the Hurt Locker. So everybody else, they're all hanging outside that radius. They're talking on the radio. But one guy walks in there. He's got his armor on. He's in the hurt locker. You know, and I think about that idea. And of course, in that story, that, I'm going to ruin it for you. You don't need to ruin it anyway. It's all right. Anyway, I didn't say I saw it. Anyway, <laughs> he dies. He dies in the hurt locker. Because he wanted to save lives. Cost him his life. Hear me. Jesus was in the hurt locker. He went into the radius nobody else could go into. He came down here and became one of us and took our sins. And if that ain't a bomb, I don't know what a bomb is. And, that, and, and he went down there and he threw himself over that bomb. Didn't he? He saved us. And guess what? It cost him his life to do that. And he's calling us to go into the hurt locker. Some of us, we want to say, I'll just stay on the outside perimeter. But he's saying, no, I want you to go in that hurt locker because there are all kinds of bombs out there, right? This is a place, this world is a place of suffering. People are going to suffer, but you have a message that can disarm those bombs and save those people. So if I'm going to suffer, if I'm going to go in the hurt locker, I want to know that my suffering has purpose. I want to know that my suffering is temporary, and I want to know that when I'm doing that, I'm going to look more like Jesus than any other time in my life. And it's going to matter. Some of you are here today or at one of our locations today, and you're going, what is this guy talking about? Because you know, you're not in that relationship with God. But you connect. You know what I'm talking about when it comes to suffering. And I'm telling you that God won't necessarily take any suffering away from your life. 
but he will give it purpose. He won't give you more than you can handle, and it will be temporary. And for those of you that want to say, nope, I don't want anything to do with Jesus, let me tell you, Jesus is God's final answer. For those of us that are Christians, let's get off the sidelines. He's calling us to go into the hurt locker. And just like Paul wouldn't let Silas go in that prison without him and took that beating, Jesus will go with you. We're moving to a time of decision.